Here we go. Okay, we, we're good now. We've got some gain. Got some audio. Starting up really soon, folks, for those watching on YouTube. Just going to start my live event. One, two, three, four, that seems to be working well. Turn off that audience view. We got some teams here. We are almost starting, folks. I can see a few people are considering joining us right now. We don't, ah, man, I haven't quite put it in the channel yet. That's my problem. I haven't put the video in the channel. Why must Microsoft Stream make these things? I seriously, this is the last, le last lecture of the year and the last time, the first time that I've ever actually screwed this up. Um, Save, thank you. Yes, it should be in the channel now. <laughs> Here it is, I can see it now. COM1720 week 12 code. going to refill my water bottle and then uh, we can get ourselves underway. Oh, where's my thing stuck on my lapel in a weird way? Sorry about that noise. Back in the room. 
Getting myself organized. <laughs> Here we go. Plugging in my lights. I really need my lights. Bang. Light one, light two, camera check. Camera one, camera two, test, test. Ah, 14.04, I think it's time to start. I think it is time to start. We're gonna go right hand side big. <laughs> Make sure I'm working. I was not connected. Would you believe it? Whoa, we made it. <laughs> we are starting now, folks. Let's make sure all my stuff is actually working. I'm always paranoid about my recordings and streams and everything, and particularly now because it's the last lecture, I'd like it to be perfect so that everyone remembers this as the course where all of the lectures works perfectly and there was never any problems, which I'm sure you will all remember it that way. Well, we made it to week 12. Who would have thought, right? At the start 12 weeks ago, or 14 weeks ago, I should say. Who would have thought that we would have 24 uh, lectures for this course posted through Teams. We would have weekly online labs in Teams where everyone was jumping in and um, meeting with each other, working together, collaborating talking to each other about their projects, talking with the tutors about their projects. Uh, we would have had live lectures for most of these weeks, then guest lectures with uh, Kieran, and 12 amazing art lectures with Tony, including this week's. I haven't watched this week's art lecture, by the way, so I hope that um, Tony is not, you know, uh, telling you, like, I suck it or something, telling... <laughs> Telling you guys a bunch of stuff about my uh, about machine learning and art, which I would disagree with, but I think that's probably not the case. Um, just going to oh, sorry about that. Making sure I'm on the screen correctly. I am. <laughs> yeah, so we are here in week twelve. And that means that all of you folks are working super duper hard on your major projects. I'm sure you're working super duper hard on your major projects also for every other course you're doing. It is sort of a tradition in courses that there would be a kind of big assignments that is, ends up being due on the last day of the course, whether or not you have an exam or not. Um, and the, uh, whether or not there's an exam or not, and particularly, um, for a course like this where there is no exam, it's often like a kind of larger assignment. So week 12 is always super, super tough. So well done to everyone for getting through this week. Um, you know, one of my old teachers from high school used to say, sometimes there are weeks like this and you can know only one thing for sure, which is that in a very small number of days, the week will be over. You will have somehow gotten these assignments submitted and away, your deadlines will have passed and you will be free to move on to the next thing and you'll feel a lot better. So <laughs> at least we can hold on to that hope. I know that's a bit, <laughs> maybe it's a bit cynical sometimes to think that way, but also that can help that you know it will pass. So what am I gonna talk about this week? You know what I'm not gonna talk about is a bunch of stuff about your major project because you've been through it many times already with me all your other lecturers, you've been to all of your tutorials and um, just had the absolute hammering of your life to get this major project into shape, I'm sure. Had people examining your sketches, scrutinizing your storyboards and everything. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about something which is kind of a field of research and interest for me for many years, 
something which is an extension on top of this, this subject, similarly to what we did last week, which was work you could go on to having done a subject like Comp 1720, and that is using machine learning for creative tasks. So when we do think about machine learning and creative tasks, I guess um, I might be thinking something like uh, artificial intelligence clip art. Like this is sort of the typical kind of things we get when we're doing, <laughs> I'll go to iStock photo. When you think about artificial intelligence, what do you get these kind of blue robot brains made of numbers? Um, some cool things. This is the kind of stuff you'd see if someone was doing a TED talk about machine learning, trying to get people to invest money in their startup. Machine learning. Oh my goodness. This kind of stuff. AI. Wow. We're going to see some robots in a minute. AI robot. So a lot of, oh, the white robots are starting to, to come in here. These little cyborgs. This is classic kind of AI stuff. Um, this kind of uh, cult, um, pop culture idea of what artificial intelligence and machine learning is. And this is what people think of if they think of kind of, if they imagine machine learning or if that's what they think of in a article in the paper, maybe it's sort of robot intelligence, robots coming to take our jobs. We're gonna to see today that robots are not going to come and take your jobs and that machine learning is something which is very very approachable really, more approachable than you might think. And in fact, it's not just approachable, but it's something that we can make art out of and using. It's a tool, it's a technology that we can use as, as uh, computer artists. And it's something that which we can critique as well through our art. So it's uh, particularly things like machine learning, it's very open to critique given how much people um, kind of mythologize it in the news, in government and policy, and in uh, business. So it's very much mythologized about something which is going to save our businesses, make us money, be magical, do everything for us that we want it to do. And then in when people talk, from, uh, talk about that stuff, machine learning AI from that perspective, we don't usually hear them explain what actually is going on in their business that's going to use AI or, or ML what ML algorithms they're going to use because if you start asking those questions, they would have to give details. And if you hear the details, then it might not be something that you like to, to hear about. Um, and it's also, I think so many people would be concerned about how much machine learning is used in things like surveillance, um, automatic surveillance of uh, people, places and things, I suppose. Uh, maybe looking in surveillance for certain kinds of people that we don't want to go in certain places. And depending on what kinds of decisions are behind uh, the types of people involved, we might call such systems discriminatory rather than a, something which is really helping keeping people safe or keeping places safe from the wrong kind of people. So these are the kind of things we can discuss about machine learning. We'll, we'll talk a bit about some technical back end in this lecture. Not so much about white robots, um, and we will look at how to use machine learning, a few different kinds of machine learning um, systems in a P5 sketch for making interactive artworks, which is pretty fun actually. And it's pretty approachable. And in fact, it's become more approachable since the last time I tried it. So this is, um, it's actually writing this lecture, putting this together has um, given me a bit of food for thought, even though I've been working with machine learning and art for some time. So, there's an admin slide, I already told you this. Major project is due on Monday. If you have more discussions or ideas or questions, put them on the forum. The tutors will be there to help answer them. I will be there to help answer them. I'm trying to make sure that we don't have any unanswered questions on the forum, so just make sure you get in there. It's a little bit hard to search for unanswered reply uh, topics, but I'm doing my best. Here's the questions we're gonna ask in this lecture. What is machine learning? How can I use machine learning in P5? And how can we make art with this? So we're gonna deal with that first question first. What is machine learning? Because I want you guys to be thinking not about the white robots, but about some uh, quite practical and approachable ideas. 
What is machine learning anyway? That's my question. What is machine learning? So here's a couple of definitions. This is a very common one. Creating computer programs without explicitly programming them. Machine learning is creating computer programs without explicitly programming them. So you might have a program, a computer program, which can create another computer program. And somehow it's going to create the other computer program automatically to accomplish a certain task without a human programmer having to, um, to control it. And the learning part, I guess, is, is not really um, encapsulated here. But the next definition, I think, addresses that a bit more. Algorithms that improve through experience. So we often think of an algorithm, I guess, being part of a computer program. But, but you could also think of a whole computer program as being an algorithm as well. That would make sense. And the concept here is that this program could be designed to accomplish a task or be created automatically to accomplish a task. Maybe it does it badly. And then somehow that information, the amount of badness of which it is at that task is used to make it better. Uh, so our experience of learning, we know as, as humans, our learning experience is that the first time we try something, we're probably not very good at it. But the hundredth time we try that thing, we're probably a lot better. And in between zero and 100, there's learning that takes place where we accomplish the task better bit by bit until we get to be uh, accomplished at it. So algorithms that can do the same thing, do something badly, then improve over time and get better. That's machine learning. That's the, the broad idea. What are these algorithms? Well, there are many, many examples of algorithms. And I think that some of you could even name some. If you, if you wanted to drop in on the chat, you could probably name a few machine learning algorithms. It's not one or two. There are many, many ideas or ways to approach this. Even though, I guess, in the, the mythologization in the last couple of years, we think a lot about uh, certain kinds of algorithms. Another thing that machine learning is, is it's kind of a big deal. There's a lot of big dollar signs behind machine learning these days because companies, businesses, governments, military have found ways to uh, have found ways to apply machine learning to make their jobs easier in terms of making money, in terms of hiring people easily and making sure they're all the right kind of person, in terms of analyzing a lot of data, or they hope that it could be useful. And so there's dollars behind it. It's also kind of problematic in the kind of, you know, um, you know political discourse, a <laughs> meaning of problematic. Not just problematic because it's a hard problem to solve technically, but because we might make machine learning algorithms which accidentally, even though we didn't mean to, happen to be very discriminatory. And that can be an issue. We have made machine learning programs which accidentally, without meaning to, have been sexist, have been racist, have harassed people, have caused people to have much very distressing situations. And so that's problematic, um, particularly because the people designing these machine learning programs might not have meant it to be that way, and yet somehow it is. So problematic. Here's an example, a little example of machine learning. We're going to do some not machine learning to start with. This is like the explicitly programming thing. So suppose the boss has come around to us, the employees, and said, write me a program to change the screen, which is going to be 400 pixels wide, to red if the mouse is in the right-hand side. So if my mouse is in the right-hand side of the screen, then make it red. And I've got a little program here. If mouse x is greater than something, then make the background red. If it's not, make the background black. So the boss has given us a task. We've got to solve it. I've got most of a pro program here. I think you guys will agree with me that this bit here, mouse is in the right hand side, means that mouse x has to be greater than half the width. And if the width of the screen is 400 pixels wide, we could put in there 200 and we would get a program that will make the, uh, the right hand part of the screen red. So here it might be five, whoops. Oh well, thought I could get my uh, my notepad to work. 
No, it's not going to work. Not even in the last lecture can I get my notepad to work. I guess I can't get everything to work. No, not working. So here's another way of doing it. Here's another approach. In this approach, we're not going to write a program. And we haven't been given such a, to what to us seems specific as a task. The task hasn't been given in the form of a sentence. The boss has said, write me a program so that the following is true. If the mouse X is 250, red background is yes. If mouse is 15, red background no. If mouse is 375, red background yes. If it's 312, red background yes. If it's 75, red background no. If it's 173, red background no. So, you know, we could... I really want my... I was really planning to draw. Ah, oh, we got here. Yeah, we got my drawing. So maybe we've got our whole screen. That's 400. We've got our whole screen. I think I'm drawing over my face now, but that's okay. When it's 250, that means that's going to be red. I'll just put an R there to mean red. When it's 15, it's going to be black. When it's 375, it's going to be red. When it's 312, it's going to be red. 75, it's going to be black. And 173, it's going to be black. Now, a machine learning way to, to approach this problem might be that you get this list of requirements or list of pairs where the input is 250 and the output should be a red background. And then the, the computer itself has to figure out how to accomplish that in a program. And we could, in fact, give the computer a kind of architecture for a problem solution, right? Like if mouse x is greater than something, then something. And if not, then something else. And it might be able to, using this data, do some tests figure out if things are right or wrong, and then produce an output which solves our problem. But in fact, are we going to get exactly the same program? Because if we wanted to put that, the threshold of changing between black and red, we could be putting it anywhere between, I guess, the last black and the first red, and we would still be satisfying the, the data requirements because it's not like we've got black 199 and red 201. So there would be only like one potential position for this threshold. It could be um, more, it could be 210, it could be 190, right? So it's never not going to be exactly the same program. And this is would be a very simple problem to solve, at least in terms of the, the required uh, out, outcomes. But maybe like to test us, the boss might have held back some data and they might have like 205, yes, 195, no. And if they had, if they had shown up with this data afterwards, we could have tested our algorithm and it might have succeeded for all of these other requirements and fail on one of these. It might succeed for this one, but fail on that one because the threshold had been put too far to the left. Um, and indeed, um, you know, Ben in the, in the chat has just said, well, you could solve this with logistic regression. That's a, a algorithm which comes under the umbrella of machine learning, which would be one way of doing this. Yeah, you could solve it with logistic regression, exactly. Um, but I guess, you know, we don't have to name algorithms or, or go into details to, to see that there's some way for a computer to approach this problem and probably find a solution, maybe after a few tests to see if it's, if it's really working right. Um, yeah. Okay, so what if we had more inputs? In, in the last example, we just had mouse x, that's one number. What if we had as input a picture? Can we represent pictures as numbers? And I think you will agree with me that we can, right? We know that a, a picture is just a 2D array of colors, right? If the first 
little pixel is a color, three values RGB, second is a color, RGB, etc. all across this picture, this um, image. So if we, maybe, maybe we can buy some very similar um, algorithm, we could actually um, learn to make decisions not just with one number, but with many numbers altogether. If we had enough if and else's and enough little thresholds and the computer was choosing those thresholds very carefully after some trial and error, perhaps we could get it to learn to identify what's in an image. So if we had enough ifs and else's, then maybe we could make a doggo classifier. It might be able to tell us if there's a doggo in the picture and if there is not. And if there is a doggo, it would say yes. And if there is not a doggo, it would say no, there is no doggo there. So I know this seems like a big leap between mouse X and a whole picture doing image recognition and classification. But really, you know, if you had enough little thresholds, maybe it would work. And in fact, it, it can work in some situations. And yes, if you have enough if-then-elses or something similar to that, um, then you can get this to work. Sort of, I say, because it, this is very hand-wavy at this point. So now, one trick we often use in machine learning is to divine, divine, design some kind of algorithm which is configurable. So we set up the algorithm architecture and then the computer can plug in different configurations to make the choices, like the choice about whether to color the background red or black, or to say there's a doggo there or there is not a doggo there. So in this example, we've got lots of inputs here. Ah, my thing still doesn't work. Well, here's all my inputs. It just doesn't like to do it in full screen, I think. And then it won't. Oh, no. There's all my inputs. Yeah, there we go. And here's my output, which could be doggo. And in between, there'd be some kind of decision-making process or a bunch of if-then-elses or adding all of these up in some way to make a decision based on all of these numbers as inputs. All these would just be numbers, just like in, in processing, in P5, a number 2.0, 1.8, 6, 0.5, 100. So the process of configuration would be choosing how much of each input we listen to in order to make a decision in this particular algorithm I'm thinking of. How much of each input to listen to. And in fact, I'm thinking of a particular algorithm, an example, which would be called a perceptron. Uh, it was something that was invented in 1958. And in 1958, they invented the perceptron for this task of figuring out whether there was a doggo in an image. Maybe not doggos, maybe they were looking for, I don't know, um, nuclear weapons bases or something in satellite image, in aircraft images or tanks through a camera or something. But they were thinking about image recognition. Can we work out to how to make a machine or a computer do what we humans do is as in look at a scene and know what is in it. So they designed these algorithms to take lots of inputs and boil them down to one decision. Fast forward 50 years, in 1958 it didn't work very well. Over 50 years since then we've learned a lot of things. Sometimes there are long periods where we don't figure it out and then someone has a great idea. Three tricks that we've learned in 50 years. One is that you feed the outputs of the perceptrons into more perceptrons and you make a kind of network. Here's an example of what that would look like. All of these inputs are going into three different perceptrons. They're, all of their outputs are going to the, be the inputs of another layer of perceptrons and then a third layer of perceptrons and then finally we get an output. One output decision. The second trick is we've learned a lot about algorithms for configuring these perceptrons, these configurable algorithms, configuring these algorithms. And this is a process that's often, often called optimization or training, trying to configure these algorithms once on some data, look at some more data, see how wrong it is and configure it again. 
look at some more data, configure it again, etc., etc., etc. And that process, making those algorithms better, is a big deal. It makes it has made a big difference over 50 years. And no one really knew how to do it to begin with, so there have been lots of creative ideas. Third trick, third trick is to have just have big fast computers with lots of data to learn from. So in 1958, they did not have big fast computers. They had computers that had to be sort of hand wired <laughs> halfway as well as programmed. And they did not have huge amounts of data. Now, if you want to learn from a lot of pictures, we can just find huge amounts of pictures on the internet. And that has been a, a, a huge way that these algorithms have gotten better just by being able to be, expose them to a huge amount more data. By the way, another name for a perceptron is an artificial neuron. So the above, this little thing, is a neural network, which you've probably heard of. So maybe I should have led with neural network, but I think that if I think about neural networks, we'll immediately start going down the, the white robot path. If we talk about perceptrons, then maybe it's a little bit, I can trick you for a few moments into thinking about it without preconceptions. So that's all of the background we're going to talk about right now. But I suppose what we've learned is that there are ways to make decisions based on inputs to a computer. There are ways to automate the process of getting better at making these decisions. We can arrange images into a lot of numbers that we then make a decision about. And that is a thing we would call image classification, which is a very important uh, task in machine learning. It's not the only kind of task, there are many tasks. Here's a bit of terminology that we've talked about already. A model, that's an instance of a trainable or configurable algorithm. We talk about models a lot in machine learning, but sometimes it's a bit of a weird word to use. A pre-trained model is a trainable algorithm which has already been trained. So if someone else has done the work to train it on a certain set of data, we get it and we can use it. What do we use it for? We use it for making predictions. So we give the trained model some kind of input that it hasn't seen before, and we see what the output is, just like the boss testing our, um, our red-black color in -era. The process of training or optimization is using data to make a trained model from an untrained model. And then classification, which I've spelled wrong, is an ML task for choosing a class or a description for a piece of data. So image classification, um, you could have classification that just is like yes, no, like is this a dog or is it not? That's a yes, no kind of question. We sometimes call that binary classification because there's only two options, just like one and zero in binary numbers. Or many class classification where you could choose one of many different options for um, identifying a piece of data. It could be images, it could be sounds, it could be um, arrangements of Lego blocks, it could be, uh, you know, jigsaw puzzle orientations, it could be poses of a human um, as 3D points in the air. There's many things you can classify, it doesn't have to be just images. So wait a minute, um, you might be thinking at this point, <laughs> Where's all the maths? <laughs> Where's the maths? Probably some of you have had this experience of saying, thinking to yourself, well, wow, I'd like to get into machine learning. And then you look at the classes which we have on offer in machine learning and you think, oh no, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of maths. Now I love maths. My, my bachelor's degree was in maths. But I don't think that we necessarily have to have maths in order to have an intelligent conversation about machine learning. We don't need to be a math major to necessarily use machine learning in an artistic project or in a, a programming project, to, to be quite honest. There's lots of ways of taking pre-trained algorithms and applying them in new and exciting ways, and you don't need much maths to do that. Of course, if you want to learn about how to design optimizers, or make the learning process go faster, or design, invent new kinds of, of uh, machine learning models, it is a great idea to have maths or a CS major. Um, but you folks are ready to go if you want to just start experimenting. You have enough JavaScript to do everything I'm going to show you today. So this is, uh, you know, this is the amount of maths you needed. You've already done it in this class. So 
get into it and see what you can make and see if we can make some interesting discoveries with these kind of systems through an artistic way, artistic process. So we're in the content of the lecture now, only half a, 35 minutes in. I'm going to talk about ml5.js. ml5.js is friendly machine learning for the web. You know it's a good website when they have like, you have to click no justice, no peace to actually enter it. So there you go. Um, friendly machine learning world web. This is a neighborly approach to creating and exploring artificial intelligence in the browser. And it is a JavaScript library. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to just get into it, getting started. They're not updating the website. Here it is. You might notice it's like p5.js with ML. <laughs> um, the reason it kind of looks like that, it's not the same as p5. It's a JavaScript library, which des is designed to let you bring machine learning algorithms that other people have created or that you might create easily into your JavaScript programs or your P5 programs. And it's inspired by P5 and the approach that P5 takes um, as well as processing. Um, but it is not the same as P5. It does, it interacts with a system called tensorflow.js, which is a kind of more uh, low level and mathsy kind of library for doing machine learning in the browser. Um, tensorflow.js sort of correspondingly is a JavaScript implementation of TensorFlow machine learning models, which people often create in Python using the library called TensorFlow, which is a popular machine learning library for implementing machine learning algorithms uh, and studying them. And I use TensorFlow a lot. I don't use TensorFlow.js that much, but I guess I am now because I'm using ML5.js. So woohoo, we're all winning. We're all a winner. Everybody's a winner. What do we have to do to get ML5 into our projects? We don't have to do very much. It's very similar to like getting p5.sound into your projects. We just have to add this little script into um, your p5 sketches index.html. And that's all you really need to do to get started with this. Well, then you need to do something, but we can, we can do the thing afterwards. But um, let me see if I had something important on a slide that I haven't said. No, I haven't. Let's get into my editor. I just love the P5 web editor. Um, I know I sort of oscillate between using this and VS Code, but it's really, really fun to be able to have a bit of a hack in on the website, on this website, and then just send you the URL. So what I've done is inspired by ML5, they had this they had a link somewhere to a P5 editor sketch that had it all organized already, but I've got my own one now. Um, just sent you, sent you a link in the, in the slides. You can try that out if you like. But all I've done really is take a blank sketch and add this bit to load up the, uh, the JavaScript file for um, ML5 now. Here's the bit where I get my bits of paper, so where I wrote my notes down, so I know what I'm doing. What we're going to do is have a go at some image recognition or image classification. We're going to do what we said we'd do. We classify some doggos, and actually, we're going to use a neural network called MobileNet. Why is it called MobileNet? And is that infringing a Telstra trademark? I'm not sure. Anyone who's old enough to know what I'm talking about can uh, ping in the chat. Telstra Mobile Net. Um, mobile Net is a, is a neural network for doing image classification, which is designed to be kind of compact and work well on mobile phones, mobile devices, and also happens to work well in the browser when it's JavaScript using it. So we would like these things to be kind of fast enough to actually use. I'm in my sketch and I want to load this up, load this, um, this classifier. So what I'm going to do is uh, make a, uh, make a variable for it, mobile net, and then I'm going to load it, mobile net, 
ml5.image classifier. Ooh, I've got to have a capital C. And we just give its name. So there are many image classifiers which we could be using. But in this case, if you want to find out, we can look over here and see all the different image classifiers that are possible. MobileNet, DarkNet, DoodleNet, etc. Whatever you want, there's, there's a few options. And that will be good. And then we're going to load our picture. I've already inserted a picture into this sketch. I guess if you want to try out my sketch, you'll find out that I've got that picture there. Doggo equals load image assets slash doggo.jpg. So I put this in the preload function. We talked about that last week. This is stuff that is happens before setup. It happens before setup. And in fact, one thing which does take a little while is this line of code, actually loading the mobile net algorithm. And that happens, it runs this line and then just goes on with the rest of the code. So I guess putting it in preload doesn't really make sense, but it's gonna load that. It has to download that model, which might take a, a second. I don't actually know how big the model is, but I presume it's a couple of megabytes, maybe two megabytes. So it does take a little while to load it. Um, then in my setup file, I'm going to do do the classification classifier. Oh, not called classifier. It's called mobile net dot classify, and I'll just give it that image. Okay. And there's something else I actually have to do here because at this point, how do we know what the classification was? <laughs> and we don't really. But this is one of the ways which um, ML5 is set up to work is that you let it go and do a bit of work in the background and then it gets back to you with a result. And there are two ways to get the results back uh, over time. I'm gonna do this way which involves making another function. So I'm gonna make a function here called got results. This function is called a callback function. We don't need to write callback or anything. It's just like a, a name of what we're doing with it because we're giving it to mobile net. We give it to it here for mobile net to call us back once it's done its work. Uh -huh. Get it? So <laughs> mobile net's gonna go away do its work, call us back and say, I'm ready. You can actually do it in another callback function here, which is like, we'll call it classifier ready. I think you can do this. Classifier ready. And then we'll print. Woohoo. Okay, and I have for my, uh, there's probably something I have to put here. Um, model ready. What's the model ready callback gotta be? Doesn't have any particular expectations, I think. I know that the got result thing does have some expectations about what it gets. The first parameter it gets is like an error in case it screws up, it needs to send you an error, it can do that through that parameter. And the other parameter is the results. So it's got this ordering to them where it starts with the error, which might be a bit seem a bit funny, start with the bad news first, but we usually don't have to worry about the bad news. So I'm not going to, I'm just gonna print results. And I'm gonna draw our image for good measure. Image doggo. Zero, zero. Great, I hope this works. There's my doggo. Classifier's ready. See, it took a little bit to load and then we get our results. It's gonna give us three different results, the top three. The first result is fountain. That might look like a fountain. <laughs> Second result is jigsaw puzzle. Does that look like a jigsaw puzzle? Third result is a park bench. Well, that's puzzling, isn't it? I guess, lol. 
So we have done some image recognition, done some image recognition, but, 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 we have not quite <laughs> got a uh, result that we were expecting, I guess. We've got some wrong results, Fountain. I guess it got confused because there's a park in the background. And maybe this, this image uh, mobile net model hasn't been trained on enough pugs wearing a jumper. So it doesn't know what to do with a pug wearing a jumper. It doesn't know what it is. Um, we might be able to find an image where it does have a good prediction about what it is, but this one is not going to work. So I guess this is the bit of the lecture where I say, you know, machine learning is great, but it's not magic. And the reason we know it's not magic is we can poke holes in it all the time. <laughs> poke, poke really obvious holes. Like here's this, this fantastic um, neural network, which we get to use. And it doesn't seem to work on like a normal sort of image that we see as obviously a dog. But, you know, this is how these things work. They're, they're based on, trained on a lot of data that's found on the internet. And it might be trained on data which just doesn't look like this picture. So that's, you know, this picture I got from Unsplash. So, there you have it. End of lecture. No, not end of lecture. We're going to do some other fun stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, these things have limitations. They're not perfect. Uh, what I think I will do now is show you how we can overcome some of these limitations. So the, the two other things I want to show you in this lecture, I guess, or a few other things, is that we can classify video and then go through it, and just have our image classifier work over and over again on the video instead of an image. And this is exciting because this sort of connects with interactivity, right? That you would be taking video, a video camera, connecting it to your sketch, letting an image classifier look at everything that's going on in your video and uh, seeing what is, is happening in it uh, and making classifications. So here's a little bit of instruction about how we could do that. This is not too bad. We can access a webcam in our sketch. I think you've went through this with Kieran. There's this P5 term called create capture and then video in all caps and that just gets things from the webcam. We can resize the video and hide it. So it's always shown if you don't do that for some reason, that's weird, but there you go. Um, then in our image classifier, we can just tell it that we always want it to look at the video and we can always tell it to, then we can just tell it to classify and get our result. And if we did that, well, you know, we would get, um, you'd be looking at me and it would be saying that I'm like, uh, a mask or something. Actually, I'm going to show you a demo of that one. Let's go on to my other computer because my other computer, because my first computer, I, when I'm using my streaming system, it tends to not like me using the webcam for other stuff. So I will be using my other computer. Um, or I can use the webcam. I've got a demo of this. I'm just going to show you. Here we go. So this demo is going to not only do the classification, but print it out on the screen, what we get. Yeah, I would like you to use my HD camera built in. I'll remember this decision. Here we go, there's me and my green screen. <laughs> you usually don't see that. Oh, it does, it thinks I've got a, a t-shirt. It thinks I'm a t-shirt, which is pretty accurate because I'm wearing a sweatshirt, so. That's good. Now it thinks I'm a mask. Well, that's not as exciting. What about this? It thinks I'm a binder, a ring binder. Okay. What about this? Bassoon. This is not a bassoon. That is completely wrong. I suppose it's a bit like a bassoon. No, it doesn't work like that. What about this? Oh, we got it for a second. It said coffee cup. Coffee mug, that's what I've got. Sometimes if I look at it, it says espresso or espresso machine, because maybe espresso machines have these in them. Okay, so this is the video version. But what I really want to show you with, with, where these things get more exciting is making your own machine learning model. And we can actually do that. 
I know this is just went, like going to get to a brain explosion point of view. We can make our own image classification model. And what I'm going to do is, oh yeah, Roman saw a few flashes of water bottle there. So it does, it will do it under perfect circumstances, but we want to be more than perfect. And I suppose, particularly if you're thinking about an artwork, you might want to know exactly what your classes are. So the mobile net model has been trained with a lot of data. In fact, the data set for mobile net has a thousand classes. And they're probably classes that are not useful to us. Mobile net classes. I'm not sure what the data set is going to be. Is it going to tell us what it is? I could probably go and find out what the classes are. Here's a bunch of Python stuff. I'm not going to look at that. <clears throat> it's got a thousand classes. We don't know what those classes are. Maybe we don't care. Maybe we only want a few classes in our, our machine learning system. I mean, this little thing is giving us some, some inspiration right now. Someone looking through the webcam and saying like me or me plus dog. You know, if you just want to find a, a few things, maybe we can train a machine learning model to do that for us. And that's what we're going to do. In this system called Teachable Machine, which integrates with ML5 and P5. So that's great. Get started. We're going to do it right now. I don't even need to, to show you what I made already. We're going to make an image project. And we get to tell it what classes we want. So this is going to be class Charles. This is going to be class nothing. I'm going to make another class bottle. And class coffee. Great. OK, here's the webcam. Remember this decision. There I am. And I'm just going to hold to record, and it'll start recording my camera. Let's move over a bit. Okay, we've got some samples. That should be good. We're going to do the class nothing. I'll have to move out of the frame to do it. Hold to record. Bunch of samples of nothing. That's good. Bottle. Hold to record. I'll get a bit more. 50 samples, cool, coffee. You know, using other people's models in machine learning is no fun. This is what I found out when years ago, I sort of decided I'm gonna be like making art with machine learning or making music with it. And the wisdom was download someone else's model and start playing with it, which I did. Play with it for about 10 minutes. And you're like, well, that's, that's it. <laughs> and then I started making my own models and five years later, here I am. So I guess I'm still playing with them and still finding exciting stuff to do. Now we get to do the training step, the optimization step where we configure the model. And you might have heard about machine learning model training that it, it takes a long time. And that's true. I'm just going to start it because it will take a little bit of time here. This is actually training it on my computer in the browser. But it's got a trick. It's got a trick. Oh, it's preparing the training data. Okay, now it's thinking. Okay, yep, don't leave that tab. You get some data or something. I won't show you that, you'll be confused. I look at those, those graphs look good, but but the trick here is that it is actually using mobile net. Mobile net has these layers of perceptrons or neurons, a, a sort of more advanced version of them that's designed specifically for looking at images, which are a 2D array of data. So because they're 2D, you can kind of consider ones near each other as being related. And so there's some tricks with the architecture to look at that. Look at it, it works. Charles, 100%. It's definitely me and it is very much me. Nothing, 100%. Bottle, 100%. Nothing, 100%. Coffee, 100%. What about bottle and Charles? We'll see what it does. Oh, yeah, it's a bit confused. What about... Uh-oh, now we get to... If I move back and put these to the start, maybe we can get an equal three. But it knows it's not nothing, so that's good. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. It's special architecture. It's called a convolutional neural network. For those who are into these things, go and look it up. There is some maths involved if you want to understand how that works, but it's a good challenge if you want to learn. Um... They're good at looking at images. 
And the mobile net is one of those. And what they've done is that the mobile net has many layers, more than three, by the way, I think. Yeah, a lot more than three. They took off like the ending layer where it makes the actual decision. I think they took off the last two layers and all the other layers are still configured. They're ready to go. And what people know is that the earlier layers tend to be useful even without the later layers. What you can then do is kind of retrain the last layer to make a specific decision for specific images you want to know about. And this is called transfer learning. It's really, really useful. A lot of specific application specific machine learning uses transfer learning. And in this case, we've used transfer learning to quickly train just those last little bits of the network in a very short amount of time in a web browser to make an image classifier for our specific purpose of choosing whether you are looking at Charles, nothing, bottle, or coffee, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty cool. You know what? We're going to get even better <laughs> because we can actually just... Um, just get a link to this I'm going to upload my model to their server and they're just going to host it for me. I mean, this is just ridiculous. We don't even have to download anything. We can just, the Google will host it for you. It's only two megs. So I guess they've got the money to host these things. They've got literally got a P5JS script here for us to get. I'm going to copy that in. I think it's actually a little bit broken to start with, but you know, never mind. We'll fix it in a minute. Um, I don't want all of this. No, I just want the script. I've already got that stuff. It's it was like doing the script JS and the the index in the same file. Okay. Here, I've got to get my model. Where's my model? It's that one. I oh, did it already put it in for me. That would be ridiculous. It has already put it in for me. Let's make sure it has, yeah. Let's see if it works. I'll just close this. Oh, stay on page, but okay. It's got to load the model. Charles, it works in P5.js. Nothing, bottle. Coffee. I'm I'm still a bit astounded about that. <laughs> First of all, how well this works. I knew it would work this well. If you do transfer learning, you can get really good results. I guess I'm I'm surprised and still a bit amazed that it's the process can be so easy. By the way, you don't have to host it there. You can download it from from Teachable Machine export model. Just download it and download it. It comes in as a JSON file, actually, which is, you know, one of those things that we know know how to use. Um, where's my? Here's my desktop. <laughs> it's not that much of a mess. There's my model. Oh, uh, here's my my weights. That's the configuration is called weights. Um, there's a maths reason for that, but <laughs> you don't have to worry too much about that. So that's all the numbers in the configuration, all the little thresholds and, and um, amounts we pay attention to each input in the image. Then our model.json is kind of the architecture for our model. That's gonna make it this kind of mobile net with the last two layers cut off then put back on again. And a few extra details in, in metadata about how it should be set up. And that's my model. So, Man, that's cool, isn't it? <laughs> Man, that is cool. Um, we're almost out of time. I've got a few more things to talk about, but not like crazy amounts of things. Let's stop that. We're going to back to my computer. I think you're back to my, my slides. Yeah, you should be. And we'll talk about one more little thing. By the way, I've got um, links to all of this stuff in the, the slides, you can check them out and give it a go. 
This is probably a little bit late to do something like this for your major project and I wouldn't recommend it right at this stage, even if you're super inspired, but playing with this could be a great summer project for you if you're a computer science or an art student. In fact, this is the kind of stuff that I would hope that folks come back to me one year from now, six months from now, two years from now and say, I really wanna do honors or a special project, research project in this stuff. Can I do it? And I would be like, yes, you have done Comp 1720. You have played around with, Tensor, with Teachable Machine. You're ready to do a more advanced project. Well, I'm just gonna tell, tell you about one more fun thing, which is like a completely different kind of machine learning model. It's also a neural network, so I guess not in that state kind, but this one is a drawing machine learning model and it's called Sketch RNN. And you, it generates a drawing by moving an imaginary pen around the screen, right? Just like you're making, uh, doing lines with in P5, moving a pen around, drawing a line, putting it down sometime, picking it up, moving it somewhere else. So rather than predictions being like what something is in a, an image, this predicts a movement of a pen in X and Y coordinates. Boy, there's a lot more details about how Sketch RNN works. Um, I've been working with this model or similar models for some time and they're very interesting, but we can talk more about them later. I really just wanna try it out. The trick here is that Sketch RNN is designed that it can sketch one kind of thing at a time. So it's been trained on a library of people um, drawing on a screen to do a certain thing. Like someone said, draw a cat, and then they drew on a screen a cat or draw a bus and they quickly sketch a bus. So a, a really interesting researcher and sort of artist, I guess, even though he might not describe himself as such, called David Ha, um, was interested in using that system to train a neural network that could sketch little drawings similarly to how all of the people had in this uh, research data set. So he designed this model, trained it, and you know, it works. You can actually get it to draw things that are in this data set. <clears throat> it only has a limited number of things it can draw, but one of them is cat. Um, and I'm just gonna show you how that works or how you could might make, use that for a bit of art. So here is an example. This one is inspired and a lot of it's taken from the ML5 JS example. But we're gonna draw a lot of cats on the screen. And there we go. There's one, there's another one. There's another one. Some of these have whiskers, some of them have tails, some of them don't, right? It's up to this neural network what they have. This um, sketch RNN system is, uh, it's actually designed so it just draws one cat and then after it draws one cat, I reset it and get it to draw another one. But it's not, there's not that much to do here. All that happens is that we see if we've got a stroke path that is like the latest output from the model where to move the pen to. And if we have, and the previous pen has been down, the stroke path knows whether the pen is up or down to do little spaces, then we draw the cat. And if it's up, then we don't. And if the stroke path says end, then that means we've finished the cat and we have to start the model again. So then I have this start drawing um, function, which will start from a different place on the screen, x equals random width, y equals random height, resets our machine learning model and generates a stroke. Yeah, so um, Rowan's just asked what would happen if you took these images and put it into the one that makes cat photos out of them. It will make some pretty wacky cat photos, but that would be a cool thing to try. Uh, I think there's some people in the listening right now who already know quite a bit about this stuff or have seen lots of cool examples. Anyway, we can try something different. I'll just, I might make it so it only draws one and also make it draw a bus instead. That's something it can do. By the way, there's a list of all the things it can draw here. So there's one bus. Give me one in the middle of the screen. There we go. That's a good bus. It kind of conks out halfway through sometimes. That's the trick with these models, but it's always fun. Now, you, there's a lot of things you can do with Sketch RNN, and it's we've got like access to exactly none of them right now. Oh, calendar? Ooh, that's gonna be good. We'll draw some calendars. 
Do, do, do. That's a big calendar. Here's one. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of just a grid. I think you can do, it says yoga. I wonder what happens if, what is it gonna draw for yoga? People or what? Yoga mats? <laughs> that's a person and a mat. Oh no, that's their arms. Another one, another person there. One, not sure what that is. Now that's pretty good, a person with their arms up. That person's kind of got their leg in a very complicated position. I'm not sure how that, if that's possible. I'll make it so it just starts in the middle. Uh, 200, what is it? 640, 320, uh, yeah, 240. So we always get them in the same spot. Anyway, this is where we start to do something which really is up the alley of what you've been doing with P5 so far, right? So you could include this in an artwork you're making with P5 and make it draw a million yoga people or a million cats or something. Um, and that would be quite an exciting and interesting thing to do. I don't know how you would use it, but you could certainly make an artwork which examines how this works and uses it in a really unique and interesting way. There's a lot more ml5.js models. Check out the reference if you're interested. Many are related to image classification. Um, processing image is so hot right now, but that's not exactly what I'm interested in. There are also some sound models for me as a computer musician, that's really interesting. There are also text generation models, which are interesting as well. A lot of things in ml5.js work. Some things don't work because it's kind of under construction. If you're fascinated by this, you could probably get into it and make a contribution to it because it's like an open source system. It's all the way out there, ready for people to jump in and help. And that's how everything in it has been made so far. People getting interested and jumping in and helping. I've got a few more slides with just some examples of machine learning art just to finish up. Here's the first one. Maybe these are things you haven't heard about because they're a bit out of left field. This is an artist called Alison Parrish. I suppose I would call, say artist, but I think um, they would be known as a poet, I guess. I think that's how she described herself one time. I saw her talk. Um, this is Alison Parrish's work, Compasses. And what happens here is that it's a book of, of these little diagrams where there are four words and Alison designed a machine learning system to invent new words that are kind of between all of these other words, <laughs> right? Between sanguine and choleric, you get calione. Between choleric and melancholic, you get calatic. Between phlegmatic and melancholic, you get phalantic. Between phlegmatic and sanguine, you get shagnitic, which is, uh, I'm not sure what that would be, but <laughs> yeah. So Alison Parrish uses machine learning um, and other compute, computational tools for poetry and writing, which is really fascinating and not really what we think of when we think ML art, where we're thinking basically about these kind of paintings that people make that are kind of like old masters, but not. So yeah, you can think about machine learning creating different artworks than just paintings. Uh, that's a really fascinating idea. Another, another crazy uh, thing, this, um, Artist is called Dada Bots. I guess it's a collective. I'm not sure how many people are in Dada Bots, but Dada Bots. Let's go to their website. Dada Bots are a kind of collective that create audio machine learning artworks that generate endless audio in a certain style. And this is a work called Relentless Doppelganger, which is a 24 seven live stream um, like death metal stream <laughs> and you can just play it on YouTube and I'm not sure if we're going to get the, you're going to get audio from it, but I guess I'll connect my headphones to my microphone. <laughs> this has been, um, That's been streaming since September 2019, so that's wild, isn't it? <laughs> that's
that is certainly something. Um, they've got a couple of other ones. I think there's one they, they did about free jazz. And at some point, like, it was, like, flagged for content warnings on YouTube, which doesn't make sense because it's all in, automatically invented. But anyway, that's... <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of things to think about in, in what they're doing, but really interesting artworks, um, creating this new way of thinking about music and performance. Uh, another really interesting artist is Mimo Atkin. Mimo has created this work called Learning to See, where a machine learning system is kind of hooked up to a camera. And there's many iterations of this one, but one of them is that like, Whenever you go in front of the camera, the machine learning system tries to recreate what it's seeing. So it's like learning to look at what you are in front of it and playing it back. And this iteration, it's kind of recreating whatever is put in front of it in certain styles. So it's taken this little pile of objects and interpreted it as if it was waves crashing over rocks, which is really fascinating um, combination of interactivity, images, and a machine learning system with this kind of learning process running continually. So really a fascinating artist and ideas. Dilpreet Singh is an, a programmer in Melbourne, working or used to work at, at Monash University, uh, created with them in this Sensi Lab group, this app which would decide if someone is, something is art or not, like you would take a photo of something that's like, yep, that's art, or no, that is not art, that is not art at all the art or not app. So that was a, I thought that was a really wild use of this kind of classification to make what we normally consider to be a very human decision about whether something is art or not. I promise I will not use this to mark your major projects, but I could do, <laughs> maybe, I'm not sure. It would be one way, as some people said, someone said a few minutes ago, that would be like, Auto marking some laboratories. Sometimes we go a bit far with the auto marking in computer science. And one last one. This is Benedicta Wallace, who is a Norwegian um, musician and computer scientist, and happens to be a friend of mine. Um, Benedicta has been working for some time on using neural networks to generate dance moves or movements by by humans, and in fact, using a system very similar to to um, Sketch RNN or something that's involved with that. I worked on her with on this system. Um, but she, her, she's been really into the data capture part and particularly in, in capturing a really unique and large data set of dancers dancing to different kinds of music um, using a motion capture system. And now her neural networks um, are sort of trained on this collection of motion capture data, which is really unique and fascinating. So it's not image data at all. This is motion capture data in 3D space. So you can rotate this dancer all around. Yeah. And that's it, right? We made it. <laughs> it's week 12, last lecture, and we did it. Um, I think I guess we should say like a goodbye thing right now, although I'm still looking forward to seeing all of your your major projects rolling in and putting together the, the major project gallery website, which will be um, activated as soon as we pass the deadline so that all the major projects are available. I guess I could say that this has been a really exciting semester running this course. I've never taught this course before. I've actually tutored it years ago, maybe six or seven years ago. Um, and it was a different kind of course then. Um, it has been a huge challenge to move things online and hope that we can give you the same experience because in this course, one of the things which we've always focused on is trying to be personally connected with, with you folks, particularly those who are learning about art and computer science for the, at the same time together for the first time. So there are many people who are quite boggled by these ideas in the early lectures. And I, I hope we've tried our best to support you folks in online modes, but I know it sometimes hasn't worked. We certainly tried our best to improve over the semester how we do that. And I think it's been quite fun. Um, it's been fun doing these lectures. And feel free to ask a question or something if there's any anybody jumping in. 
But other than that, I will say I'm really impressed with how everyone's going. I'm really impressed with the feedback we've gotten and the quality of your assignments and really looking forward to seeing the major projects. I've seen a few demos which have been uh, super duper fun so far. So I'll be in the chat, ask a question, catch you folks later. I should also thank the tutors. Well, now we've had time to thank each other. I'm just going to stop this recording and stop this stream. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the major projects. Good luck with that and all with all of your other exams. And let me know if you have any more questions on Discourse. And particularly if you really enjoyed this course, have a think about what you're doing over summer. Happy to talk with any folks who are interested, particularly about this machine learning stuff or any um, computer art topics really. We're here to do big projects as well as be your teachers. So if you've got an idea, send me an email or send one of our tutors an email as well. I guess I could say at the end that the tutors in this course are students who previously took the course. So if you like what they were doing and you would like to do it too, Keep your eyes on the uh, notice boards around computing, <laughs> various notice boards and the jobs.anu site. When we do advertise for tutor positions, kind of at the end of every semester, we're looking for new people who would be interested. So think about it. We won't be recruiting for this course until the end of semester one next year. Um, so um, you'll have time to think, but this is a great course to get started tutoring if you're uh, taking it and you're keen on it. So let me know.